<clears throat> Dear Joachim, ladies and gentlemen, and looking into the room, uh, dear friends, because many of you are not unknown in my personal uh, agenda. But I will not mention all my friends here because some of my friends would be surprised that I'm considering them as being my friends. So uh, <laughs> I, will, I will refrain from that. Um, I, I would like to start uh, by thanking the center and especially my dear friend uh, Joachim for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you today for your annual conference. Whenever you are starting a speech, you have always to say that's a great pleasure to be where you are. Normally, this is a lie, but this time it happens to be, it happens to be true. Uh, I had uh, yeah, the pleasure to know and to work with Joachim for almost as long as I have been in politics. That's a long moment ago, in your case too. Uh, we were both, uh, that was a special period, ministers for labor at the same time in the 1980s. He was in government in 86 when Spain took its rightful place in our union. And we later worked closely together he as a commissioner for economic and monetary affairs and myself as a president of the Eurogroup. That was not always a pleasure because uh, we had uh, many controversial debates, but at the very end, he lost. <laughs> <laughs> but he is a convinced European and a proud uh, Spaniard, always ready to stand up for our union, and he did it again and again. There are plenty of reasons for us to be positive today, just as the title of your conference is suggesting. It is not so long ago that our union was in danger of sleepwalking from one crisis to another without waking up. This was the alarm call in fact, we need it. Since then, we have slowly but surely turned the page from this so-called poly crisis. And we have been able to do so by being united and by delivering on things that matter. This has been my priority since uh, the day uh, the Commission took office. We have already delivered 80% of the initiatives, 368 out of 460, to be precise, that we said we would when we took office. We had some luck along the way, but we also made our own luck. When faced with the wake-up call, Europe's leaders and institutions came together. We chose unity. Together, we chose to rally around a common positive agenda and renew our votes to our union. And the results start to speak for themselves. Every economy in our union is now growing healthily. Employment is uh, at an all-time high and unemployment at a nine-year low. Nine millions of jobs have been created since uh, the beginning of the mandate uh, of this uh, commission. Nobody is saying that the commission is the explanation for this explosion on the European labor market. But would we have lost nine million of jobs? The commission would, of course, be responsible for that. Business and consumer confidence are at the highest level uh, this century. Investment is picking up, in fact, everywhere. But it's not just about numbers and figures. We have also made steps forward together that many thought unthinkable even back in 2014. We saw this with 10, 25 countries taking part in the historic launch of permanent structural cooperation in defense. The sleeping beauty of the Lisbon Treaty as I described it, 
and we did it at the end of last year. The European Union has also stepped up on the world stage. We are now the driving force of global and fair trade. With like-minded partners such as Canada and Japan, we are helping each other grow while setting standards that uphold our common values. Together, the Union and Japan already account for a third of the world's GDP. The new agreement could increase our exports to Japan by a third and save European companies 1 billion euros in custom duties every year. At the same time, it will enshrine gold standard protection when it comes to food safety, regulatory standards and environmental protection. We have also shown, we try to show, that we are a union of solidarity. In 2016 alone, we offered asylum to three times as many refugees as the US, Australia and Japan combined. That's what we are calling the European Fortress, three times more than the US, Australia and Japan combined. And thanks to our proactive European approach, we were able to reduce arrivals to our shores by 63% in 2017. There are many other examples I could choose to show how Europe is indeed back on track. But my message today is that we cannot slow down. You must now press the accelerator. We still have a lot to do. Between now and next uh, summer, when Europeans take the polls, we must deliver on the reform of the Economic and Monetary Union, secure our borders, overhaul our asylum system, get back to Schengen, complete the digital single market, bring the Western Balkans closer to our Union. If we achieve this, our end destination will be a more united, democratic and stronger Union at 27. By the time European leaders meet at a special uh, summit on Europe Day 19 in Sibiu, Romania, and there we must be able to show our citizens that this new Union of 27 works for them. The Commission will be full steam ahead until the very last day of uh, our mandate. And starting tomorrow, European leaders will meet 19 times in the next 18 months to tackle the issues that matter the most to our Union. And since we are on the eve of the first of those 19 meetings, I want to touch on the importance of tomorrow's discussions, in particular on the new multi-annual financial framework. I see it as an opportunity for Europe leaders to send a clear message that Europe is not only back, but that it really means business. Every seven years, Europe has to decide on a new budget for our Union. It is time for decisions. It is about deciding what kind of Europe we want, about what we want our Union to be able to deliver. First, we must agree on our priorities. Then we can talk about numbers, about figures. It should not be the other way around. And if we have ambitious goals, then our budget should be equally ambitious. Last week, we spelled out in black and white the choices that the European Union faces. Let me give you a concrete example. When we ask Europeans what their top priority is, securing our borders consistently comes out as the first or second answer. So we must decide now how to deliver on that. We could, for instance, choose to maintain the European border and coast guard as it is. Or we could upgrade it so it has more stuff, more tools, a bigger role in returns. Alternatively, we could transform into a fully-fledged border management system with 100,000 EU staff. Each of these options 
are debated and are discussed. But each of those options comes at a price. The first of those options, maintaining the system we have, would need an 8 billion euro investment in the next period of seven years. The second, upgrading the border control, would need between 20 and 25 billion euro. And the third, having 100,000 staff, EU staff, uh, would need 150 billion euro. We must decide what it is we want to achieve. And then we must back, come back to the resources we need to do this. And to do that, we need member states to change the way they think about the European budget, a budget that only accounts for around 2% of public spending in Europe. There is unanimity in the Council. We have those who do not want to pay more, and we have those who don't want to receive less. That's the only piece of unanimity we have in the Council. But these two things are not really swimming in the, tra in the same uh, channel. So the logic has to change. We need a budget that matches our ambitions. For instance, we want to be world leaders in the renewable energy and get ahead of the curve on new technologies. If we want our union to have a role in that, we must give ourselves the tool we need to make it happen. The next budget will have to be large enough to manage new priorities and at the same time plug the gap left by the United Kingdom's withdrawal. That may mean that some pay more. We have to be honest enough to say this now before the debate will start. And on the same note, member states must know the value of the budget as well as they know the cost of it. We can all be net beneficiaries. European money invested in one country or one region has, of course, a value far beyond one border. But tomorrow will not be a time to make final uh, decisions. But it will be an important moment to show our willingness to swiftly agree on an ambitious and flexible and simplified budget for our future. As I said earlier, Europe must now go full steam ahead. Delays on our journey are not an option. For the last budget, a slow agreement proved very costly. At this time, back in December 2013, the fact that we were not able to agree earlier cost 5,000 research jobs for every single month that we, do, that, we, that we did not agree. And it could cost up to 600,000 Erasmus places in 21 if we are not agreeing on the budget before that uh, date. But everyone, all the Prime Minister, are saying that we have to increase the number of those uh, being in the Erasmus program. We have to bring the money where our lips are. Too often in Europe we talk about challenges and forget about opportunities. Equally, we spend too much time discussing intentions rather than results. Now that Europe continues to regain its strength, we have a once in a generation opportunity to build a stronger, more united, and more democratic union we collectively deserve. We should grasp this opportunity with courage and with boldness. This is a time for action, not only for discussion. Last September, delivering the speech on the State of the Union at the European Parliament, I spoke of a union of equals, a union which is open to the Western Balkans, a union with an enlarged euro area, Schengen space, banking union, a union which stands up for fairness in the labor market and that is more accountable and able to take decisions in a quicker and more effective way. This union, the one I'm speaking of, is not abstract. We can deliver on it now without treaty changes. 
This is why I set out the roadmap to CBU and my leaders also agreed on an agenda to get us there. So we are now fully focused on making sure Europe stays on this track. We must take it step by step, starting tomorrow. But just as those who set out on this journey 60 years ago, we must never lose sight of where we want to go. Let's go together. Thank you.